We are gathered here in the midst of our own lives, hopes, and needs, and those of God's beloved broken world. We are gathered for worship in the presence and in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God graces us with honesty and courage as the baptized followers of Jesus. If we pretend that we are without sin, we are only fooling ourselves and hiding from the truth. But as we confess our sins to the living God and to one another, our faithful and just God will forgive our sins, cleanse us, and free us to walk in newness of life even now. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess, we admit, and we give to you our sins. We have rejected your ways and your love by our actions, our words, and our thoughts. In things we have done, and in things we have left undone. We are entangled in patterns and systems bigger than ourselves that defy your will, and we are complicit in their rottenness. Despite your fierce love that will not let us go, we have turned from you and failed to love you with our whole selves. Despite your good desire for us to love our neighbors, strangers, and enemies, we have turned from them as well with hardened hearts. Despite your call to be stewards of your good creation, we have failed to care for your world, for which we are made. In the midst of these sins, we call on you to forgive us, free us, and turn us around. For the sake of Christ Jesus, your Son and our Lord, renew us so that we may witness to your love and walk in your ways in the midst of your world. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and by his authority, we are forgiven. You are forgiven holy and freely by the deep mercy of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit each of us is set loose to live anew in open freedom even here and now. Amen. We'll sing together our gathering song Open the Eyes of My Heart.
and also with you. Together we'll sing our song of invitation, Welcome to the Family of God, and then our Kyrie and song of praise.
believe in the hope of those who doubt. May we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Many other signs in the 
present of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's a funny thing if you think about it. There is no force, no power, no ability to coerce that can make Jesus move if he doesn't want to move. And at the very same time, if Jesus is determined to go somewhere, ain't no one, no power, no nothing, all creation that can get in his way if he is determined to get somewhere. I've been thinking about the, the playfulness of the way that John Arnera tells the story, not only of Jesus' resurrection appearance that we just heard, but also how it reverberates what happened when Jesus was on trial back on Good Friday, the story that we tell and we tell year after year. And to hold those two side by side, you notice something. When Jesus is on trial in front of Pilate, Jesus stays in one place and is not intimidated, not for a moment, even though he's the one on trial, even though he's the one whose life is at risk of being put to death, even though he's the one the soldiers mock and eventually gets put on a cross, Jesus is calm and collected and unafraid, and it's everybody else who's dashing and running around like chickens with their heads cut off, and Pontius Pilate going outside to talk to respectable religious people, and come back in to talk to Jesus, and then bring him outside, Jesus just stays calm. Jesus doesn't move that whole trial scene, but the, the religious leaders and Pontius Pilate and the soldiers, they're all moving everywhere. Jesus, who is just comfortable to stay where he is in that moment, nothing makes him move, nothing makes him squirm, nothing makes him shiver with fear or fright. Jesus faces all that with an almost stoic sort of groundedness. And when he's confronted about it, when Pontius Pilate says, don't, why are you being quiet? Don't, don't you know I have the power to crucify you? Jesus just calmly responds and says, look, my kingdom from this world, yep, we'd be playing the same game that every empire does, we mount an, uh, an army to take over to fight back, but that's not how it works, and my kingdom isn't from here, so I'm not afraid of your authority, Pontius Pilate. You and your empire, you and your soldiers, they do not intimidate me. But Jesus doesn't want to move. He doesn't move. But when the empire tries to put him in one place and stick him there, when the respectable religious people try and put him in one place and nail him down, literally nail him down to a cross, Jesus won't stay up there. Really. We've been telling the story. We tell every week, honestly, about how the Jesus, who the powers of the day, put on the cross and say, say put, Jesus rises and busts out of every place we try and hold him down, every place the powers of the day try and get Jesus to stay put, because not only will Jesus stay put if he is determined to stay put, but when Jesus wants to move, he ain't no power in all creation that can stop him from moving. Even locked door. This is the thing that absolutely floors me. Not only, not only is Jesus willing to stay in one place when Pontius Pilate is parading in and out and in and out when Jesus is on trial. Not only does Jesus rise from the dead and now, as we sometimes say, as we wrote on the cross out there in the yard or out on the sidewalk last weekend, Jesus is risen and on the loose. When Jesus is determined to get in some place, nothing stops him. So on that first Easter day, on that day of resurrection, after Jesus is banished from the tomb and is not there, and appeared to Mary Magdalene, who thinks he's the gardener, God lover, Jesus knows where the rest of his disciples will be found. They are afraid. And so not only have they all decided to stay indoors and not told the news to anybody else, they've shut the doors and locked them because they are afraid of somebody doing the same thing to them. Locked doors don't stop Jesus. John doesn't give us any explanation of how it happens other than to say the risen Jesus can't be stopped on hell or high water. If Jesus is determined to get somewhere, Jesus is going to get somewhere. And Jesus is determined to show up among those disciples because he knows they are afraid and they need someone to let them out. We have this conversation with uh, my son from time to time. Because he's at that age, at 11 going on 18, 
that he would like to be uh, independent and grown up and he is too cool for school. He's certainly too cool for his parents sometimes. And at bedtime, we have to remind him, it's fine if you want to shut your door at bedtime and turn off the light and be in your own little world, but please do not lock the door. Because if, God forbid, if a fire would happen, if an emergency would happen, and we need to get in there, please don't lock your door. And once or twice, he has locked the door and then forgotten in the middle of the night and then realized in the morning, oh my goodness, the door locked. Okay, buddy. Hold on, it's okay, but the door locks on the inside, so you're going to have to be the one to unlock it, because I don't have the power that Jesus does. But Jesus, who is determined to reach into his disciples, who are walled in not just by walls and an actual lock on the door, but by their fear, Jesus is determined to get in there so that they can be set free. They're panicking, and can't figure out how to get out. They're not even sure they want to face the world again, and Jesus is determined, no, I will go in there, even inside of them locked doors, to be present where you are, to meet them, and to set them free. Not just free from the locked door because maybe they're in a panic and don't know how to unlock them, but because they are both so afraid and so ashamed of how they acted the last time they were in the same place with Jesus. And they realized the women stuck it out with Jesus, the women are there to cross, but the rest of Jesus like, man, they were chicken hearts and all ran and scattered. Peter himself even denied even knowing Jesus. The best case scenario is that they all looked the other way while their Lord was being crucified. They're all aware that if they had been in those circumstances, they'd say, that's it, I'm done with you. I want nothing to do with you. If you'll deny me, I don't want to be, I don't want you to be a part of my community. Honestly, not quite sure what to make of a risen Jesus. Is he going to come back looking for revenge because they hadn't stuck it out? comes to let them know he bears no grudges. There are no ill feelings. There is no estrangement from Jesus' part. The first words out of Jesus' mouth, peace be with you. As if to say, I have not come to judge or condemn or zap you for not having strong enough faith. I've come to let you know I come in peace. Not, oh, you guys should have believed better, or didn't you hear from Mary Magdalene I'm alive again, or didn't you believe me all those times I told you that I was going to rise from the dead? first words out of Jesus' mouth are peace, as if to say, there is no animosity between me and you. Whatever shame you brought into this room that now has gotten trapped in here, set me free from it. Whatever fear has gotten trapped in here, I'm setting you free from it, and now you are free to go. You do. <laughs> and yet, even though one of Jesus' own hand-picked followers, Thomas, isn't there that day, and can't believe not only the word of Mary Magdalene, but the rest of the disciples, who all insist they've seen Jesus. And when Thomas says, I can't believe it, sounds too good to be true, it blows my mind the idea that he could be alive again. I won't believe unless I put my fingers in the nail marks and, and my hand in his side. Jesus isn't put off by that either. He shows up to make another appearance when they are locked inside again a week later. and says, okay, Thomas. I'm here for your sake. So this, I'm not here to judge that you don't have strong enough faith. I'm not here to scold the rest of the guys because I told you you don't have to be locked inside anymore. And here you are locked inside. Again, I bring none of that judgment. I'm only here to set you free. I'm only here to set aside whatever baggage you brought in here with you that now has gotten you trapped. I'm here. And you can know I've put all that aside. So Thomas, along with all the rest of the disciples, bring guilt and shame for what they didn't do or how they didn't speak up for Jesus and fear about what's going to happen next that makes them feel like they're trapped in a dead end as well as doubt that Jesus really could be alive and Jesus is not stopped by any of those things as you may have heard if Jesus is determined to get somewhere he's not going to call creation, he's going to stop him not a locked door not our guilt, not our shame, not even our wobbly shame Jesus keeps showing up to set us free from the things we keep shackling ourselves with that keep us enclosed and trapped to tell us that the things we think are dead ends are not dead ends. And Jesus says this not just to people 2,000 years ago, but to you and to me as well. And if we are going to be very honest with one another, which I thought, there are an awful lot of times in this life when we let stuff become baggage that gets us trapped inside and we find ourselves locked inside our own hearts and afraid to let anybody else in, 
much less Jesus, because we're not really sure what's going to happen when we live banging around inside those parts of ours. So sometimes we carry with us guilt or stuff we've messed up, and we are afraid to face. Sometimes we bring shame from stuff in our past that we can't let go of the memory of, no matter how hard we try. Sometimes we bring doubt and then guilt about how our faith doesn't feel like it's strong enough for whatever the very so-and-so or somebody else. We find ourselves also locked inside spaces like that, that we construct inside our own hearts. And Jesus' appearance to us doesn't say, well, you didn't believe hard enough, or sorry, you've done too much bad stuff, that's it, I can't work with you all, Jesus. Showing up to set us free. And those very same first words he spoke to the disciples are his words to you and me. I come in peace. I've not come to zap you for not having good enough faith. I've not come to zap you for past mistakes. I've not come to zap you for the shame that you feel about whatever long list, long list of reasons you might bring. I've come to set you free from those things. Those things don't hold you back from me anymore. I will move heaven and earth. Get to you. And then open the door from the inside so we can walk out together. If you find yourself on this evening, feel like you are locked inside somehow in your own heart. If you feel like there's something that has got you trapped and you're not really sure how to get out of there, Jesus shows up tonight and says, Whatever it is, whatever it is we brought, Jesus says, I've come to set you free from it. You don't have to carry it anymore. It doesn't have to block the door anymore. I've come inside the locked heart, and I'm letting you out and opening the door, so we are free to move. And if you find yourself already feeling free, I'm not burdened by guilt. I'm not feeling like I'm constrained by shame. I'm not feeling like I'm constrained by my wobbly faith. Good news. You're already set free. Now your job is to find somebody else who is still locked inside their hearts and set them free as well, so that you can presence of Christ they need. Our job is to go from this place, to go help other people who maybe are still trapped inside the baggage they keep piling up beside the door of their heart and that they're afraid to let anybody else into your calling in mind to let people know that Jesus keeps showing up to speak peace to them. That Jesus says, you are mine, you are beloved, no matter how wobbly your faith has been, no matter what things are still racking you with guilt, no matter what things you are afraid of or ashamed of or have a hard time believing, I'm here to set you free. So in the days that we feel constrained, Jesus shows up inside our locked doors and says, I'm setting you free. And on the days you're already feeling free, good. Your job is to go to Jesus and help self set somebody else free. It's famous, 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 famous the point that ain't nobody can be free. And that's what Jesus for people who remember and honor and worship the Lord, who's willing to stay put on trial and not move in the conscious pilot at once and two, it is also deeply good news that if Jesus is determined to move and get somewhere, then nothing is going to stop him from getting there. So even on this, even on rainy and yucky outside, Jesus shows up here in this place among us.
congregation of faith. We profess the faith that has claimed the followers of Jesus from the beginning. The faith given to us by God to bring to the world the same faith invoked over us in our baptism using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the midst of our needs and those of the world, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Made alive in Christ and filled with His Spirit, we come to you, O God, knowing that you awaken faith amidst our doubts and fears. Reveal your presence that we will recognize your power at work in your church and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Holy Creator, the earth receives your promises of new life. Seeds die to bear fruit and plants decay to nourish the soil. Restore all living things as you intend. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Giver of peace, when you make your presence known, you speak peace into the midst of other people. So bring such peace to peoples and nations ravaged by war, violence, and natural disaster. Here in our own communities, in the wake of torrential rains in Ukraine and in all places around the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Healing God, you breathe hope into rooms of despair. Be with the sick, the lonely, the grieving, and those with any need. Especially we lift up to you, Jeff. Amelia, John, George, and those we speak out loud now or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of welcome, you are with us in this assembly as we worship. Bless all who you will draw into this community and be with those who cannot be present with us this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of life, with you all things are possible. But the saints of all times enable us to live in hope, trusting that though we do not see, we believe, and we will trust your promise that you will gather us together with your people of every time and every place in your resurrection feast, which has no end. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. into your hands, O Lord, we give all these prayers, names, and needs, along with those whose names and needs we do not know, trusting in your deep mercy through your Son who came into our midst, Jesus Christ our Lord. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. You're invited to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
congregation rises as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us in this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here in our midst, the living Christ has come. The living God has embraced us in love, and the living Spirit has refreshed us to be people of hope and messengers of good news. We are now sent into the midst of the world, still aching for that good news. And so we call on God to bless us for the journey. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you sing together our sending song, Touch the Students and Heal. Thank you. 